and good morning. Good to see you all here today, and uh, we're going to focus for the next uh, few minutes here on on uh, our class on the Revelation. And today we are going to tackle a particularly challenging topic that is, I believe, the central point uh, to be made uh, by the Revelation, uh, and that is the the battle between good and evil, particularly how overwhelming evil always appears to be and how it is always nonetheless defeated uh, by good. Uh, Let's begin uh, our time with some prayer. Father, we thank you that you are in control, that you have already won through the gift of your son, uh, through his death and resurrection that we celebrate today, that you have already won the battle against evil. Uh, Would you open our minds and hearts that we would be open to that message that we would be able to aptly apply that message to our lives and to the lives of those with whom we come in contact through your son that we pray. Amen. Amen. So the problem with evil is as old as Genesis itself. And all the way through the Bible, we see over and over again this cycle of evil building up seemingly uh, indomitable power and then uh, having circumstances or having odd things happen or or just who knows what. And out of that comes uh, the defeat of evil by the forces of good. And so uh, from, from from the third chapter of Genesis on, uh, we're going to see this happen, uh, and we're going to see the theme reiterated throughout the Bible. The story of Noah is the story of evil finally being defeated by being wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, there are times when we would like to see that play out in our world as long as we could determine who gets wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, but uh, I, I think God introduces that theme that early in the process to point out that wiping everybody off the face of the earth does not defeat evil. Uh, all it does is defer evil until the next crop of grapes grows <laughs> and Noah decides to partake of uh, the results of his uh, grape arbor. Uh, and, and suddenly we have the problem cropping up again. So it doesn't, the mere punishment, mere ending of the life of an evil person does not in any way negate the forces of evil uh, or even uh, stop them. It will merely slow them down uh, briefly. And so this remains one of the most challenging uh, concepts uh, to explain. Uh, and, and it is it is quite possibly the most challenging thing for us to deal with. Uh, How many of you have had someone uh, who's just experienced maybe a a premature or what might be designated as as an undeserved uh, death or an uh, an unexpected bereavement of someone who was really good? We just had a a member of of our congregation uh, shot in the back. Uh, as he's driving to uh, pick up some groceries. Uh, Clearly a case of mistaken identity or just a a random shooter. We still don't know uh, what that is. But I'll guarantee you James did not deserve the bullet in his back. That's just, uh, you know, James is is such a wonderful guy. And so we're faced with this on a a very, very nearly daily basis. Uh, and we're and we're faced not just with the reality of the forces of evil at work in our lives, but we're faced with the reality that we need to explain <laughs> how that works, because people out there ask the question, uh, and and of course there are all kinds of of other things. Uh, the one that really gets me is is the abuse of women and children and people who can't defend themselves. Uh, by those who are who are uh, in a position of power and and therefore in a position to abuse people, human trafficking, uh, that sort of thing. Maybe you want to include your pol- your political op- opponents in this uh, as being a part of the forces of evil against good. Uh, the The problem here is we end up being asked questions like, 
how could a loving God allow fill in the blank to happen? Okay? Any, any of you ever had that question asked to you? How could a loving God allow my child to die? How could a loving God take my wife away from me? Um, how, how could a loving God allow all of the evil that we see in this world to not just continue to do what they're doing, uh, but to do what they're doing with impunity. <laughs> um, we've, we've got a, a madman uh, in, in Russia continuing to do terrible things, and there really isn't a thing we can do about it <laughs> here. Uh, we are marshalling our forces, and, and we are providing uh, the, the help that we can provide uh, to our Ukrainian uh, brothers and sisters uh, and those who may very well become brothers and sisters as a result of this. But that doesn't address the real question. How can a loving God allow this sort of thing to happen? And there, there, are, there are theoretical answers. Um, and, and most of those answers are ineffective at best. Some of those answers are downright wrong. How many of you know uh, of people who uh, particularly seems to happen with children. Um, child dies, parent says, Why, how, how can a loving God do this to me? And the answer is, oh, God wanted your child uh, to, to be with him in heaven. And so he took you. Now, is that the God that you serve? That is not the God that I serve. <laughs> This, this is not a God who takes children unilaterally and, and without, um, you know, without warning or justification just because he wants to have some company up there in heaven. Come on. Uh, that's just wrong. <laughs> and yet we get answers like that to the problem of why is there evil in the world and how can an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God allow those evil forces uh, to be at work? Now, we have a biblical answer to this, don't we? we? Anybody recognize the book of Job? 38 chapters of nothing but how could a good, loving, all-knowing God allow this to happen to me? And all of his friends come up with all these stupid answers. You must have sinned. If you're not aware of it, then you need to be aware of it. It's, it's got to be your fault. It can't be God's fault. And then we get four chapters at the end where God says, okay, Job, you've, you've asked for an explanation. And I, I love the King James language, gird up your loins, son. <laughs> and, then, and then we got four chapters of answer. But... What is the actual answer to Job's question that he receives? Think about it. Does, does God ever say, here's why this happened to you? You missed a staff meeting that Satan attended, and so we had a little chat, and had you been there, you would have, no, that's not the answer at all. The answer is, where were you when I set this all in motion? Uh, how can you, a human, a created being, understand the thought process of a, a, a being that is so far uh, superior to you uh, that, that you can't think my thoughts, much less know what I know, much less know the plans that I have in place? The, the answer is mostly unsatisfying on an intellectual basis, but Job buys that answer, doesn't he? In fact, there's only two chapters into it. Job's, okay, okay, I got it. <laughs> and God says, I'm not done yet. I got two more chapters of where were you when I uh, did this or did that. Um, the, the net result of all of those discussions and all of that writing is God is in control. It is not our job to understand this. It is simply our job to be faithful through whatever events, good or bad, come into our lives. All right? That's Job. 
And at the end of Job, Job says to God, I got it. <laughs> I, I got it. Uh, I, I spoke about things I, I didn't have the wherewithal to speak about, and, and therefore, we're good. We're good. And of course, God immediately turns right around and blesses him. Uh, so there's, there's a, a nice bow on top of the package at the end of it. But if you're talking to someone today who is in the mode of loss and perhaps inexplicable loss, I don't know that sending them to Job is going to do the job. But sending them to the Revelation, actually not a bad idea. What do we have over and over and over again in the Revelation? We've already done enough of this to see what happens. And what happens is... The forces of evil look insurmountable. They look like there is no way that the forces of good are going to overcome them. And then the battle ensues, except the battle doesn't actually ensue. The the battle just stops. It just, it's done. And evil is defeated. And beasts are thrown into the bottomless pit. And uh, the dragon is chained for a thousand years. And all of those things what the revelation is telling us is not only do we not have to understand it, but we're probably not going to understand it. The question is not, do I have a good answer for why your child was taken from you? Uh, I, I don't have a good answer for that. What I do have a good answer for is God loves you. <laughs> and God is going to make these things work together for good. Does that ease the pain? Not in the least. And if you promise it's going to ease the pain, I think you're stepping beyond the bounds of the biblical message. So I've probably gotten a little ahead of myself here, but this is so important, people. This is so important for us to be able to effectively reach out to people who need the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ is not that you will not suffer. (laughs) In fact, The good news of Jesus Christ includes the message that you will suffer, okay? Things are going to happen. They're going to happen, and it's going to look like evil is overcoming good. Uh, It's going to happen, and it's going to look like it's not fair, because it isn't. It's going to happen, and it's going to be painful, and you are not going to recover from that pain uh, in in many cases uh, for years, if at all. And none of that is really at issue. What is at issue is... Are you going to continue to be faithful to God? And part of that faith is, can I trust him when I do not understand what's going on? And the revelation gives us the answer to that. You can trust him. He is going to make it work out. He has already made it work out, and he will continue to make it work out. Will it work out on your schedule? Probably not. Will it work out exactly the way you'd like it to? Definitely not. You're going to have some suffering in this world. And if, if, if we are approaching people who approach us and say, how could a loving God allow fill in the blank? If we're approaching them with, it's all going to work out for good, without that context of faithfulness, without that context that faith includes Believing in things that we cannot see. And I think that includes believing in things working out when we can't see how they could possibly work out. Uh, Unless we have that component, which is so well represented and repeated over and over again in the Revelation, we will do a disservice to the people who come to us and ask that question. So, onward and upward, there are no good answers. The standard answers are not only unsatisfying, but they're usually dead wrong, and they can be downright damaging. Uh, But the Revelation asks these same questions. It, just like Job, gives no pat answers. Oh, don't worry about it. It's going to all work out. Uh, Tell that to the guy who's in the holy city and is surrounded by 200 million troops of the forces of evil. How is that going to work out? How could that possibly work out? Well, you know, it's going to, but the revelation tells us not just to be braced for the the reality that evil is going to look like it is insurmountable and undefeatable, um, but 
the impact that that's going to have on people's lives. If we go back and look at the, at the seven letters, we will find that the revelation, while not having any of the pat answers that we might like to have, will satisfy that need in really radically new ways. Paul, Paul explains some of this, uh, and, and you can go back, in fact, next week we will spend some time looking at Jesus' words and at Paul's words and see how those play out uh, in the Revelation. Uh, so I, I'm not telling you that these answers don't exist anywhere else uh, in the Bible and particularly anywhere else in the New Testament. But what I am telling you is in the Revelation, they are condensed and then they are repeated. And we find this situation comes up and it all works out. And then this situation comes up. It looks the same, but it's different, different players, uh, different uh, things at work. And it works out. And, there's this, and it works out. And the commonality here is not, did we avoid the pain of life? The answer to that is, no, we didn't avoid that. The answer is instead, God is good, God is loving, God is going to make this work out, but there will be suffering. And the seven letters make this clear. A couple of these churches have already experienced some, uh, some problems uh, with, the, with their relationship with the world in which they're operating. Uh, a couple more of them are going to experience it. But notice, out of seven churches, there are really only four where it's overtly clear you are going to or you have already suffered persecution because of your faith. The other three, they may have experienced uh, some of this and, and they, they may have experienced it after the letters were received or they may not. Uh, the message there is not everyone is going to suffer in the same way. Uh, the message isn't even everybody's going to suffer at roughly the same time because you're all operating within the, the confines of the Roman uh, Empire. The message is no matter when you live, <laughs> no matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter the government under which you live, there will be times of suffering. Will your suffering look exactly like your neighbor's suffering? Probably not. Will it be there nonetheless? Yes, it will. Will God respond faithfully to that? Yes, he will. The question is, will you respond faithfully to God in spite of, perhaps even because of, the persecution that you're going through? So uh, the, the key here is God is in control. In addition to that, <coughs> I think the revelation makes a good point. God is not the source of evil, okay? Bad things happen to you they do not happen because God wants th bad things to happen to you. They happen because Genesis 3 was not just the fault of Adam and Eve. <laughs> Genesis 3 is the fault of each of us. Each of us is faced with that choice. Do I rely on my relationship with God or do I try to get to that forbidden fruit and get a little more knowledge and become the equal of God? And that's what the serpent promises them, you see. You will not surely die. That's the first lie. You will be like him, like God, knowing good and evil. Yeah, he was telling more or less the truth there. But what he didn't say is, in the process of gaining that knowledge of good and evil, you will also realize that you have evil in your life. And that that evil is not something that you're going to be able, be able to overcome on your own. <coughs> Excuse me, the, the whole rest of the Bible from Genesis 3 on to Revelation 22 is all about how do we individually and as worshiping communities, how do we express that faith in the face of persecution, in the face of personal loss, in the face of living in a world that is the antithesis of what we believe and that really would rather see us suffer because we don't agree with them. We don't fit in. <coughs> and so as a consequence, uh, we need to remind ourselves that uh, God is not the source of evil. 
He didn't bring this on in order to test you. Uh, he didn't uh, choose to allow Job to suffer uh, because he wanted to, to test Job. He wanted Job to ask those questions. And it's clear that he wanted Job to ask those questions because he never once reprimands Job for asking those questions. You notice that? He, he has a tone of voice about him that, that says you, you probably should be careful how you word things uh, with your creator. But at no point does he say, you shouldn't have asked those questions. What he says instead is, where were you? <laughs> how, how is it that you have raised yourself up to the level of uh, being equal with God and therefore demanding explanations from God? That's the issue. And once Job gets that picture, nothing gets better about his life until God intervenes, but he understands why it's happening even though God has, through no words overtly, said why it's happening, Job suddenly says, this is my lot in life, and this is how it's going to work. This is just how it's going to be. I'm going to continue to rely on God, and to his credit, he does continue to rely on God, even as he calls God to account for all this. So, don't allow anybody to say that God is the source of this evil. He's doing this to test me. James, for one will not allow that uh, to go on. Evil is a necessary evil. There's a nice little play on words. In addition, there is this matter of random chance. It's entirely possible that James was shot in the back uh, <coughs> because he, he reminded somebody of somebody else. They, there was mistaken identity. It's also possible that this was just somebody with a gun and ammunition who said, let's, let's see what happens when we fire bullets into a car. Oh, look at that. It breaks the glass. Um, there, is, there are random things that happen in the world, and to blame God for those, oh, that's all, that's all part of God's plan. No, no. God does not plan for evil to happen. God responds to the evil that happens because we have a tendency to get sideways and generate evil as a result of that. We need to talk really quickly about the problem of causation this happens and then this happens, but does the thing that happened first cause the thing that happened second? Uh, and, and this gets us into all kind of trouble as parents. I, I told you not to do that, uh, and now you know, things are, are going to happen that are, that are negative. Uh, well, you're going to have to be the perfect parent if, if you're going to make that causal uh, connection because the next time that you allow your child to get away with that, suddenly all your teaching is out the window, okay? Um, and I, I love stories that I've heard of parents who wish to issue grace, but who contextualize that grace. What should I be doing right now? You should be spanking me, okay? What am I going to do instead? And why am I doing the good thing instead of the bad thing? Because I'm trying to model for you how God sees you and how God responds to you. Uh, you deserve death. You're not going to get death if you live the life that is faithful uh, to God. So <clears throat> our tendency is to go for a really simplistic cause and effect world. Um, and, and you'll find people out there who believe this with all their heart. If they could just get themselves to be good enough to be in this assembly with the rest of us good people, then things would go well for them. And they are suffering right now, not because there is evil in the world, but because they're just not good enough to be in with the good people. I had a lady at, uh, at a church that I ministered to years, uh, years ago who said, uh, God won't forgive me for what I've done. I said, really? You, you don't think God has the power to forgive? Oh, he has the power. Yeah, yeah. He, he, his, his son died on the cross. She could tell me the whole story. But he won't forgive me because what I've done is worse than what you've done, and therefore I am less deserving of his grace than you are. And so he will forgive you. He will not forgive me. Now, do we have a story we can tell that person? I tried. It, <laughs> how many which? 
Uh, well, there's, there is that. And, and I did go to, to Paul, who describes himself as the chief of sinners. Yeah, uh, it didn't work. Um, she's, she's convinced that, that she is uh, unforgivable. And, and I, I continue to pray that, that she has found uh, somewhere in her life uh, the, the ability to see God as more powerful than she is. As what she's really saying there is, I am capable of sinning a sin that God is incapable uh, of forgiving. Um, and we can get into all kinds of uh, problems with that, but watch out for this simplistic cause and effect. Because I have done this, this is going to happen. Maybe, uh, you know. Uh, but because you didn't do this doesn't mean that this bad thing isn't going to happen. Okay? And, and it amazes me to this day, there are people on television saying, if you will just be a part of my church and send money to me, your life will be good. How can you make that promise <laughs> when you know from Scripture that there will be something in your life that will not be good, and it really doesn't matter which church you are a part of or not a part of, life is going to throw you some of those things. And the revelation is all about not getting simplistic about cause and effect, um, but instead recognizing that things are going to happen. Sometimes they will happen by happenstance. Sometimes they will happen because I make a bad decision. Sometimes they will happen because somebody else will make a bad decision and it's going to negatively impact me. The only thing that does not change, the only thing on which I can rely as all of this is happening, is God. He's not going to necessarily take the pain away, but he is going to defeat evil as he already has through his son. So, <clears throat> to simplify this down to only good things happen to good people and vice versa is really Number, number one, it's dumb because you can't demonstrate it. <laughs> there's, there's nobody you can point to and say, look at them, they are such a good person and nothing bad has ever happened to them. That's just not a story that's going to play. Okay. Uh, nor are you going to be able to point to somebody who's been really bad all their lives and say, look at all the bad things that have happened to them. How many of you know people who do bad things and seem to be rewarded for them? Yeah. Okay, so this, I, don't, I don't know why people are attracted to this utterly simplistic uh, and incapable of explaining anything about life thought process that says good people have good things happen to them, bad people have bad things happen to them. Therefore, all I have to do is be good enough and nothing bad will ever happen to me. Uh, it's not going to work. The pattern would be clear to all and obviously bad people would say, oh, I understand how this system works. All I have to do is pretend to be a good person and good things will happen to me. Uh, our whole legal system is, is built on this idea. If you do a bad thing, we will send you to a bad place and we will punish you. Uh, we call them penitentiaries because we are, we are supposing that they are going to generate penitence on the part of the people we incarcerate. And they do from time to time, but not consistently by any stretch uh, of the imagination. Uh, so to, to think about the world in those simplistic black and white either or uh, ways is, is demonstrably uh, not a good idea and it certainly is not theologically a good idea. So the revelation gives us an alternative. Instead of dividing the world into good and bad, we're going to divide the world into faithful and unfaithful. Good things are going to happen to bad people. Bad things are going to happen to good people. Good things are going to happen to good people. Bad things are going to happen to bad people. Just depends on the situation, the circumstance, and, and what's happening. That's really not any of what the Revelation is talking about, nor is it, I think, uh, a part of the, uh, of the rest of the Bible. Yes, if you go back to God's original proposal to his people, he makes a pretty simple proposal. Uh, in fact, he sets his people up. I, I, I love the picture of them coming to the promised land, finally, 
after an entire generation dies off and a new generation gets raised up with the idea in mind that you're going to cross the Jordan and you're going to take, uh, take the promised land, he, he then sets his people up on two mountains. And the mountain over here is the mountain of blessing. And this is all the good things that God is going to do to you or for you if you are faithful. And then all the people over here on the curse mountain, here are the bad things that God is going to do to you if you are unfaithful to him. Uh, and, and he sets that up in a way that might make you think simplistically that if you do good things, you'll get good results. If you do bad things, you'll get bad results. But it misses the point of who God is. His people immediately, I mean, they get through Jericho. The very next city is Ai, which is a little tiny place, much smaller than Jericho. Joshua doesn't even send the whole army up there. And they fail. Why do they fail? Because they sinned. <laughs> Not as an entire people. One person makes a bad decision and it throws a negative situation on the entire group of people. Folks, that's exactly the world we live in. That's exactly what happens. And that's exactly what the revelation is about. When bad things happen to good people, do they respond in faith? Do we respond in faith? Or do we respond, well, that's not fair. I'm going to go find another God. Okay? Uh, the revelation says... Be faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. And that's the deal that we have before us. Not faithful unto death and nothing bad will happen to us. Faithful unto death and nothing will ultimately impact our salvation, our relationship with God, our eternal relationship with God. So, Revelation's alternative um, interpretation is well founded in other scriptures here's uh, psalm 14 the fool has said in his heart there is no god they are corrupt they have committed abominable deeds there is no one who does good yahweh has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand who seek after god they have all turned aside together they have become corrupt there is no one who does good not even one <coughs> folks that's the message we have <laughs> uh, when we have people come in here and they're concerned about how good we are what's the first thing we tell them hey <laughs> we're all sinners we we dress up and we clean up and and we try not to let you see that too much but we are all sinners uh, the psalmist is right here if we only got what we deserved we would all be dead that's good theology um, God provides us with that which we do not deserve. Uh, and that is not just grace, not just forgiveness, but relationship in spite of how bad we are, not because of how good we are. So uh, the, the psalmist gets it right. No surprise there. The concept is the connection between behavior and blessing is not a result of God's system of reward and punishment. We rejected that system by not being good when he offered us that option. Instead, he offers us the option of being forgiven for big sins, quote-unquote, small sins, quote-unquote. Any big sins or small sins out there? They're kind of all the same sin, aren't they, right? It's, it's we get selfish, we get uh, self-centered, we decide that we want to do what we want to do in spite of the fact we know God doesn't want us to work that way. Uh, and so uh, the, the idea of reward for good behavior, uh, punishment for bad behavior, just isn't going to fly anywhere in the Bible, particularly not in the Revelation. Here's Deuteronomy 11. As God is lining his people up, getting them set to cross the Jordan and go uh, uh, pay attention to, to uh, uh, the promised land and, and acquiring the promised land. By the way, did they ever conquer the whole promised land? No. Nope. Nope, never happened. Which means, did they fulfill God's command? Nope, <laughs> didn't happen. Did he bless them anyway? Oh, man, he just pours blessings out on them. Um, 
we, we have every reason to believe that in spite of our bad behavior, God still wants to be in relationship with us. Can't explain it. Don't know why that is. I think that's a sign of his bad taste in who he wants to hang out with. But here we are, gathered together, because he chooses to have relationship with us in spite of who we are. So, Deuteronomy 11. You shall therefore, God speaking to his people, keep every commandment which I am commanding you today so that you may be strong and go in and possess the land into which you are about to cross to possess it so that you may prolong your days on the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers to give them and to their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land into which you are entering to possess it is not like the land of Egypt from which you came, where you used to sow your seed and water it with your foot like a vegetable garden. He's, he's talking about going to the Nile River, dragging your foot sideways through the dirt and forming a little channel over to your little garden plot. You have to work to make this happen. And God says, boy, do I have a land in mind for you. You're not going to have to build little channels and irrigate your garden. I'll, I'll irrigate it for you. I'll bring the spring rains. I'll bring the fall rains. I'll prepare the land. I'll give you great, big, huge bunches of grapes. Remember the, the 12 uh, spies? And they're carrying back uh, signs that this is an incredibly good land. And, and do the people of God see that? Uh, no, they see the giants. Uh, they don't see God. They don't see the results that they could get. Uh, they just see, you know, I'm, uh, our army is not capable of defeating that army, so let's go back to Egypt. And, and we all know how well that turned out. Uh, to continue, <clears throat> but the land into which you are about to cross to possess it, the land of hills and valleys, drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which Yahweh your God cares. The eyes of Yahweh your God are always on it from the beginning even to the end of the year. It shall come about if you listen obediently to my commandments, which I am commanding you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. He will give the rain for your land in its season, the early and the late rain, that you may gather in your grain and your new wine and your oil. He will give grass in your fields for your cattle. You will eat and be satisfied if you will simply give up this futile trying to be God in your own life, to be the source of the power of your life, to be the one who solves the problems, the one who figures out how to irrigate your own land. Rely on God. He will irrigate your land. And so we reinforce this idea of God's desire to bless us does that mean that that overcomes the forces of evil in our lives? No, it really doesn't. But what it means is he is reliable to bless us if we are faithful to him. Okay? Good results as a reward for good behavior has been rejected. <laughs> um, and, and I believe um, very firmly, having had a good look at my own life, that uh, I have rejected that offer directly myself, and uh, I'm postulating that everyone in this room has rejected that offer at some point. Uh, we are all deserving of death. None of us are deserving of the relationship that we have been given, and that relationship remains in place in spite of our occasionally rejecting it. So the, the idea that we can be good enough to get the good results that God has promised isn't going to work. Good results are in spite of bad behavior, not as a reward for good behavior. If we get good outcomes, <clears throat> or if we got good outcomes, only as a result of good behavior, nobody would ever experience good outcomes because we just can't get outside of ourselves that far, which is why we have to be continually cleansed, John's words in First John, continually cleansed as we're walking in the light just as he is in the light, the one who continually cleanses us. And so it's that vision that we need to keep in mind as we read the Revelation. Blessings result from faith in God. Faith may or may not result in good behavior, but faith always results in faith. And if we have faith in God, we're able to go to him and say, Lord, 
I messed up again. I don't know what's wrong with me. Actually, I do know what's wrong with me. I'm human. <laughs> I, once again, I throw myself on your mercy. I rely on your grace. And I try to keep that uh, relationship uh, intact. And he says, yeah, I know. I know what you did. And I know why you did it. Uh, and, and yeah, you're a little aggravating. But that's okay. I still love you. And we still have a relationship. Uh, that's, that's how that one works. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. And if you, if you don't like the good guys win as a primary theme for this, then look to Jesus, who is the central figure, the star, the linchpin on which the entire revelation revolves. Look to him, and invariably, when we talk about faithful response, the first person we talk about is Jesus. He came to earth. He gave up being in heaven with his father because his father said I need you to go do what these people bless their hearts can't do for themselves and he was faithful in that so when we are faithful when we respond in faith part of what's happening is we're emulating our savior who was faithful now we can't emulate his sinlessness we've tried hadn't worked but we can emulate his faithfulness, his response to say, no matter what you're asking me to do, I will do it. Uh, and all he's really asking of us is a faithful reliance on him. Okay? So faithful witness may result in suffering. In fact, over time, I think we can guarantee faithful witness will result in suffering. Christians will go through trials just as their Savior did. Uh, we'll see some of this next week when we look at, at Paul's uh, projecting what the church was going to look like uh, in the future. And there were going to be uh, trials and tribulations. And he was going to be right in the thick of those things. I think about all the times he was imprisoned and, and uh, beaten and, and falsely accused. And all those bad things happened to him. And through it all, he responded in faith. Did he deserve all of those things? Probably not. Uh, did all of those things happen because they were part of some uh, grand uh, plan? That, uh, he's going to get better as a result of this? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on your, on your theological look at, at uh, suffering. Uh, but in the final analysis, he continued to rely on God even as he was sitting in a jail in Philippi with his partner Silas. And he responds with worship in song, which we're going to participate in in just a few minutes. So Christians will go through trials. The devil's about to cast some of you into prison, so you'll be tested. You'll have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death. I will give you a crown of life. That's chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, promise to, um, uh, to, to the, the seven churches. Uh, faithful unto death is a reality for Christians then and now. We, we have Christians who are being persecuted in various parts of the world. Uh, and the response is faithfulness, not, not to respond by, why couldn't I have been born in the United States of America where they don't persecute Christians? Yeah, they do persecute Christians. And generally speaking, you won't be killed as a result of that. Uh, but you, we all will experience, have experienced, some form of persecution the question is, were we faithful? Do we continue to be faithful? Another one from chapter 2. Uh, praise for, um, uh, for Pergamum, I believe this is. You hold fast my name, did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Satan is hard at work. There wasn't anything they could do about their brother Antipas. He was going to be killed, but he was faithful to death as were the other members of that church. They all get lumped in. One of them dies. All of them are praised for being faithful. So everyone suffers. The choice is not between suffering or not suffering. <clears throat> Number one, there's a question of why are you suffering? If it was deserved, then you don't really have anything to complain about. If it was undeserved, the big question is, will you remain faithful in the face of this suffering? Bad people will ultimately suffer for bad decisions. Uh, here's an example, another example from Revelation. 
Uh, another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives the mark on his forehead or his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength with the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whichever or whoever receives the mark of his name. It's easy for us to get into this simplistic mode, even if we don't believe that uh, living a good life will result in only good things in our lives. We do tend to think that living a bad life has its rewards that are built in. Just think of all the things you can get away with because you're living a bad life. The Revelation tells us that behaving badly, being faithless to your God is its own punishment. It, there is not a reward for being a bad person. Uh, Satan is not a part of that uh, relationship. And we have to watch our, our theology. We can, this can get in the way. Tempted and tried, we're often made to wonder how, how it should be thus or why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living around us, never molested, though in the wrong, uh, we've sung that song, and I think it's wrong. <laughs> uh, those people who appear never to be molested, uh, I think we can make a case that there are bad things going on in their own lives. In fact, how many of those people have you seen do a turnaround and come to, come to one of us and say, how, how can I get out of this endless cycle of evil that I seem to be in? all the time. Um, it is, it, it contains the seeds of its own punishment uh, to behave that way. And that's part of the positive message that we can take out. So I, I want to wrap this up at this point, and we're over time once more, and I apologize for that. The revelation calls us to get outside of our easy answers, uh, to, to get outside of the simplistic cause and effect uh, if we'll just do this, these good things will happen. I guarantee if you do these bad things, bad things will happen. That's not the issue and never has been. The issue is simply one of faithfulness. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have blessed us to be in relationship with you in spite of the fact that we are a selfish, uh, self-centered, uh, self-sufficient people. We thank you that you have set the bar so low that all we have to do is rely on the grace that comes from your Son and then to simply be faithful. May we be faithful through our lives. It's through your Son that we pray. Amen.